All right, what's happening, fish freaks, fish fanatics, and fish fools? Uh, today I'm going to be planting some Monte Carlo. Uh, I'm going to show you how I trim it before I put it in the tank. And it is tissue culture. So the Monte Carlo I have in there right now just isn't doing that well because I planted it when I was using pure hard water. Right now I'm doing 50% RO water, reverse osmosis water, and then 50% tap water. So that's greatly reducing my carbonate hardness. And then we're also going to be talking about uh, carbonate hardness, the buffer, and adding acids to your tank if it's something you want to do, if it's something you should do, and then of course if there's any easier methods. So we'll go over that as well. So let's get right to work as well. The Rotala bossi is doing really well and I'll show you that. So it's a good indicator plant as far as having soft enough water, you know, adequate amounts of nutrients, and then of course adequate amounts of light. It's looks like Pagostum and Stellatus, which is a pretty hard plant to grow. And so that's what's cool is it's a little bit lower maintenance. It seems like you can grow it in a low-tech aquarium, and I'll show you that here in a minute. So anyway, let's go ahead and plant the Monte Carlo. Okay, so I've taken the tissue culture and I took out all the gel, and I've already trimmed a few. So what I was going to show you is you can see how some of these are long. What I like to do before I put them in the tank, just so it looks more aesthetically pleasing and it also promotes growth as I go ahead and I trim all the tops off before I plant it. And you want to do this with stem plants as well. Well, not the tops, but with stem plants and rosettes and all the other plants, you want to trim their roots before you plant them. And of course that makes it a lot easier to plant. Um, for things like tissue culture Monte Carlo and tissue culture um, HC baby tears, it's kind of a good idea to do something like this. Makes it easier to plant. And then it also just makes it look more attractive. And of course it'll stimulate new growth as well. If anything, it's going to make the plant acclimate faster to your, to your environment. This is more than enough, so I'm going to be stuffing it in there. Okay, so now let's go ahead and... I'm going to turn off the filter and we're going to go ahead and remove the Monte Carlo that's in there. And it's doing all right, but you know, I put all this in here with really hard water, so Everything's growing a lot better now, so it's kind of better just to reset it. It's going to take too long to bounce back in a low-tech tank. See, if it was a high-tech tank or something, it would be a different story. But I kind of like showing how you can grow certain plants without having a lot of you know, CO2 or pressurized CO2 in the system. Um, Sometimes I'll still use Excel, and I know Excel is really controversial, but it's almost better as just an algicide, you know, and it can be hard to balance these small tanks. So I really don't recommend a little tank for a beginner because you have to clean them a lot. They collect a lot of detritus. The plants themselves can become organic pollutants. If the plants are unhealthy, plus just the fast growing plants, they shed a lot of organics. And so a small tank is harder to balance as far as, you know, having the total uh, TDS, the organic fraction of the TDS can get really high, you know, per volume of water. It's just because there's not a lot of water. So there's not as much buffering going on. There's not as much balance because there's just less water volume. And so for a beginner, this is like a four gallon. For a beginner, you know, you probably want at least a 30 gallon or bigger um, just to be safe. And of course, after I plant these, I'll do a quick water change just to get rid of some of the detritus that's, you know, being stirred up. And it's nothing crazy. You just... You do bury some of it. You just want to do it like that. And I have these 
kind of pressure release tweezers that are pretty nice because it holds it on there and then it lets go as you plant. So those are kind of nice to use. And I know one of the most annoying things in the hobby, <laughs> at least for me, is planting in this soil because the soil is so light. So my brother, he recently got into the hobby and he was telling me how he was like, man, when I was planting all those plants, I was about ready to just explode because they just kept popping out of the substrate. And I was like, welcome to the hobby, dude. Like that's part of the hobby. Like part of the hobby is patience. That's why I talk about patience a lot on the channel, or at least I did in the past. Um, see, that's going to pop out. This is such a small tank. It's the small tank really is more of an advanced. Nope, see, it's going to stick. We've all been there. Yep, see? Too big of a clump. You can put your finger down like that to catch it. And then I delicately, delicately move the soil back around. Now, I'll even kind of push it like that because I have an, um, a nearite snell in here and I don't want it. You know, uprooting the Monte Carlo. That's almost basically it, guys. I can't even really fit any more in here. You know what I might do? Let's move this dwarf Amazon sword. Let's put some more Monte Carlo right there. I might bring that back up a little bit. Probably push that one down. Sometimes you just have to know when to stop. Like, okay, that's good. Don't touch it, you know? Um, Man, I'm almost thinking that's about it. This, I could try and put some in there. But I'm afraid it's just going to push the other clump out. Put your finger down. Oh my god, dude, this tank is way smaller than it seems. Some guy was like, put more plants in there, and I'm like, uh, no. There's absolutely no room for more plants. Okay, and I'll take this Amazon sword. You might say, hey, yeah, put it right there. I can't. There's like... A rock in the way, you know? So and there's a crypto cryptocorine or cryptocorine or however you want to say it. I just call them cryptocorines. Um there's one right there. I could probably put it right there. Okay, so I did trim the Ludwigia, obviously, and I did trim the Rotala Bossi. So there's the Rotala Bossi, like I was talking about, and it's looking really good. I don't know if you can see that. It's looking really good for a low-tech setup. It's like a nice, delicate plant. Um, this is the Ludwigia Super Red. It can be grown in low-tech. I'm just getting some snail poop off of there. So I do have a lot of different pond snails in the back filter section, which is pretty cool. And then I do have the um, nearite snail that goes along throughout the tank. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and do a quick water change and get some of this uh, Monte Carlo out of the water. And I'll be right back. So what I'm going to do, which is probably obvious to some of you, is I'm going to break up this last clump. I totally forgot. A lot of times Monte Carlo can be grown on rocks and wood. So I actually had some Monte Carlo in this hole up here when I first designed the tank. So I was just forgetting. 
And you could use super glue, but you can also just wedge it into the crack of a rock and it should be able to stay in there. Now a trick you can actually do in your performing water change just so the water doesn't splatter everywhere. If you're using bottles, even if it's a five gallon um, jug, it'll have the lid. You can take the lid and just set it right under the water surface. You can kind of move the lid up and down just to determine the best spot. This allows you to change the water quicker and then of course it reduces the splashing. You can also use a colander, which is a really um, popular method. And that's you know kind of a method that was popular popularized by George Farmer. Now I'm basically the hobbyist that popularized using super glue um, worldwide. So you know who's keeping track, right? Go ahead and turn the filter back on. All right, so now let's go ahead and talk about uh, buffering and the acids and that kind of stuff. All right, so I wanna go ahead and talk about the buffer, the carbonate hardness, how it relates to CO2, how it relates to adding acid to your tank and those sorts of things, how to balance your aquarium. And so the easiest way to basically reduce the carbonate hardness in your tap water is just to dilute it with RO water, with reverse osmosis water, or distilled water. I'm hearing that some people are adding some types of acid to their aquarium, whether it's hydrochloric acid, muriatic acid, or whatever it may be. I'm not saying that that can't work. And in the process, a byproduct is it will actually create a little bit of carbonic acid and a little bit of CO2 when it reacts with your bicarbonate buffer. But the thing is, if you have really hard water, it's not going to work. What's going to happen is you're going to add the acid until you reach the equivalence point and then your buffer is going to crash. And then at that point, you're probably going to have to add a little bit more of a bicarbonate back to the water. It's basically playing chemist. It may work for people that are really advanced and they know their exact carbonate hardness per liter, and they know the molar density and every, you know molar mass of their acid and all kinds of stuff, and they can get like the perfect amount, but it really actually is plain chemist, and it's not necessary. Buying those acids is more expensive than buying RO water. It's also, to a degree, dangerous because you are adding some sort of acid to your aquarium. Um, I mean, it could be ascorbic acid, those types of things, but if you have really hard water, with a really high bar bicarbonate buffer, adding ascorbic acid, citric acid, even hydrochloric acid, even sulfuric acid isn't going to do anything for a long time. That's what the buffer is for. The buffer, the bicarbonate buffer is buffering the acid. So you're going to have to add a lot of it and then you're going to reach the equivalence point and your buffer is going to crash. It's totally unnecessary and again it's an added expense. And so I want to talk a little bit about how CO2 relates to the bicarbonate buffer because when it comes to carbonic acid, it's different than how hydrochloric acid or sulfuric acid or even phosphoric acid relate to the, carbonate, the carbonates and the carbon cycle because carbonic acid is a part of the carbon cycle. So what I'm getting at is when people get a pH meter and they're saying, hey, I'm pumping tons of pressurized CO2 into my aquarium, it's making my pH go down. That's true, it's freeing up hydrogen, it's creating hydronium ions, but because CO2 is a part of the carbon cycle, it's not actually depleting your buffer and it never will. That's why when we talk about acidification of the ocean, we're talking about carbonic acid coming into contact with carbonate, which is the coral skeleton, which when one carbonic acid meets the carbonate, it, cre it creates two bicarbonates. But once you have bicarbonate as the buffer and you have carbonic acid being added to the system, it's going to create free hydrogen, but it's not actually ever going to degrade your buffer beyond a certain point. So yes, the oceans are becoming acidified, there's acidification, but that's different than meeting the equivalence point and flipping the whole thing and crashing the buffer. And so when people say, hey, I'm using the pH meter with my CO2 and the CO2 is making my 
um, pH go down, what they're really talking about, the fear, the misnomer is the fear is, oh no, my buffer's going to crash. Really, it's a proxy for the fish's respiration. And like I've talked about in past videos about fish physiology, we follow boar's effect, they follow root's effect because we have lungs, they have gills, those types of things. You'll find that tetras and certain fish that have evolved in estuaries that can have up to 20 parts per million CO2 have a greater tolerance for high CO2 than something such as a rainbow fish. And so when these people are talking about, I need to turn my CO2 off with a pH meter and that kind of thing, they're actually, what they're really meaning, even if they don't know it, is they're talking about the fish respiration and the threshold for that specific species. And you can, I mean, you can do these experiments on your own. If you have a bunch of fish from South America that come from high um, carbonic acid estuaries and you put them with rainbow fish or other fish that come from high carbonate, low CO2, you know, moving streams and those and rivers and those types of things, basically high rapid rivers, um, high current areas, uh, the rainbow fish and those type of fish will always start hyperventilating before the other fish because they've evolved to naturally have a lower tolerance for that level of CO2. Anyway, I hope this has cleared up uh, some things when it comes to balancing and buffering and CO2 with the carbon cycle. Basically, just use RO water if you have liquid rock, and there's absolutely really no reason to use a pH meter. Uh, just slowly increase your pH over time. If you notice your fish are hyperventilating, then dial your CO2 back. And it's going to be relative for each person's aquarium based on your water volume and based on the type of fish that you have in that aquarium. So if you see that your fish are hyperventilating, you can dial your pressurized CO2 back. Now you've met the CO2 threshold for your specific setup. Anyway, until next time, keep your sleeves wet. Peace out. <laughs> so I do dose uh, Seachem Prime, Seachem Flourish Comprehensive, and Flourish Excel at a water change. And then I'll do this uh, one more time per week, and then I'll do this every other day. Now, I know this is controversial, but it's actually in a stable form of uh, glutaraldehyde. It's not exactly the same, and it really does help um, as an algicide when it comes to a small aquarium such as this. Uh, it's controversial. If you don't want to use it, you don't have to.